Hi AP World students, Mrs. Longnecker here again. And in today's video, I want to do a quick overview of a topic that is not well covered in your textbook. Specifically today, I want to talk about 19th century migrations because there were a lot of migrations happening. People were really moving around the world in the 19th century. You can see on the map that I'm putting up on the screen now just some of the major migrations. And so you may notice migrations coming out of East Asia, coming out of South Asia, migrations from the Middle East and different parts of Europe, migrations in the Americas. People are really moving around the world in the 19th century. And so it's worth taking some time to think about the causes of those migrations, as well as some of the consequences of those migrations. So let's start with causes of 19th century migration. One of the key causes um, are demographic changes. Now you might remember that term demographic means that we're thinking about population. Now, there's an overall growth in the world's population in the 19th century as a result of increased food supplies, improved medicines, um, right, general improvements in health and well-being around the world. We see this spike in population starting in the 19th century. And what that does is in places where they begin to feel population pressures, um, that causes people to need or want to move into places where um, there is greater opportunity for them. Urbanization and the growth of cities is also another cause of migrations, but this time it's a pull factor. So if population pressure is pushing people to migrate to new regions, the availability of work, of opportunity in these new and growing cities draws people into those new regions in particular. Migrations in the 19th century are also facilitated by um, the improvements in transportation. Transportation allows migrants to get farther from home more quickly, but also allows migrants to return home. And this is really significant because we often think of human migration as people moving from one place to another and settling permanently in that new place. And certainly if you grew up in the United States, a lot of our cultural stories around migration are focused on that moving from one place to another and then staying there. But that's not the most common story of migration in the 19th century. For example, Japanese agricultural workers in throughout the Pacific um, would migrate or move to new regions throughout the Pacific to work um, on some of the agricultural plantations that were arising on Pacific islands, but they were then able to return home either seasonally or after they had made enough money through their work, they would return home to their families and their communities. Um, and so these migrations were not necessarily permanent. Railroads also provided migrants an opportunity to move to an area, maybe perhaps seasonally, um, to work in a particular industry and then to move back home again um, when, when they made enough money or when the work dried up or things like that. So population is growing, cities are growing, transportation is making temporary or seasonal migration a much more viable option for people moving over long distance. Um, it's also true, one of the causes of migration in the 19th century is kind of the, the classic story that we think of in American history um, about workers who are freely choosing to relocate for work. Free relocation means that people are not being coerced or forced into migration necessarily, but it doesn't necessarily mean that people are moving just because they want to. Um, so when we think about um, people who are freely relocating, we might think of the very stereotypical story of European migrants coming to the United States for jobs and opportunity or for land that wasn't necessarily available back home. That would be a really good example to think of here. We could also, though, think of groups like the Irish, who are a European group that migrated to the United States, but weren't necessarily motivated just by opportunity or by land. 
But in the 19th century, we know that Ireland suffered a terrible famine, which was a, a significant motivation for migrants to move to the United States because they thought there would be um, an opportunity to keep their families from starving to death which isn't the same kind of freedom that we stereotypically think about, but they weren't being forced by an outside actor necessarily to come to the United States specifically. On the other hand, there were other migrants who were coerced or forced to migrate for labor purposes. In the early 19th century, of course, we know that the transatlantic slave trade was still continuing, and so enslaved Africans were being transported against their will out of West Africa and into uh, the Caribbean, Brazil, and North America. Um, later in the 19th century, we see um, Chinese and Indian indentured servants, so people who are entering into a contract of labor for a certain period of time in order to pay off a debt or um, open up some additional opportunity. Um, the, those migrants were forced to migrate to different regions in order to pay off their contracts. And we also see convict labor. So people who are convicted of crimes were forced to migrate at times um, into what were called penal colonies. You may have heard the story that Australia was originally founded by convicts. Uh, it was because Great Britain used the continent of Australia as essentially a huge penal colony and um, convicted felons would be sent off to Australia to do labor there rather than being put in prisons in Great Britain. So we have a lot of different reasons why people are migrating. Population pressure, uh, rise and growth of cities, transportation made migration faster, easier, and not necessarily permanent. Some folks uh, relocated um, of their own free will, looking for opportunities to improve the lives of themselves or their families, while others were coerced um, either through contracts or enslavement or um, legal penalties to migrate away from their homeland and into another place. With these causes in mind, let's now turn our attention to some of the effects or consequences of migration. So one thing to um, keep in mind is that most of the migrants of the 19th century, whether they were temporary or permanent, were male. So most of the migration is being done for labor purposes, and most of this labor was being done by men. And this has some a couple of interesting and significant impacts. One is that it changes the demographics in the places where migrants were going. We see a large influx of men from particular areas of the world into new areas of the world as they came there to work. But then we also see a demographic shift back in their home communities where all the men, well, not all the men, but many of the men are leaving. And so the communities then are primarily made up of women and men who are either too old to migrate for labor purposes or too young to migrate for labor purposes. And so the women in these communities then end up taking on new roles in their home communities. We see women stepping into positions of political power, of economic influence, right? You can't expect that women would stay in what Western society saw as the, the stereotypical or appropriate sphere for women, right? Staying within the home and family, the community would cease to function. It would just collapse into chaos and everybody would starve. So as men leave to um, either earn wealth or pay off debt through these labor migrations, women then step into their roles of raising crops, raising animals, raising children, managing the market, trading, um, settling disputes, ruling over the communities in whatever way is appropriate in that particular culture. Um, but we see women stepping into more and more of those roles as the 19th century goes on. As some, uh, as male migrants or as any migrants are moving into new areas, they have to adjust to the new communities that they are living in. And 
assimilation, the process of blending into the new culture or community of an area where you might be moving to, is a really difficult process, a really time-consuming process. And so a trend that we see in the 19th century, as well as at other times in world history, including today in the 21st century, is that migrants, as they move into new communities, look for other people like them and tend to settle in clusters of people who are coming from a similar cultural background. And we can call these areas ethnic enclaves. And so migrants, whether it is um, just a primarily male group of migrants or eventually as we see whole families coming um, in some of the more permanent migration situations, we're, we're seeing people create these ethnic enclaves and they transplant their home culture into their new place of residence, their new community, um, in order to keep in touch with what was familiar, what was important. And we see evidence of these ethnic enclaves in our world today. If you've ever been to a large city that has a Chinatown, that is kind of a classic example in the United States of an ethnic enclave, of an, a part of a city where the, the language may be different, the cultural expectations may be different, even the architecture, the buildings themselves may look different because it is reflective of the culture of the people who came into that area. We also see Little Italy or um, right some of these um, Koreatown, right? There are different names for different ethnic enclaves in different areas. But if you've ever gone to any kind of big city, you're almost certain to have seen one or more of these ethnic enclaves, depending on which groups have settled in that city. The receiving societies of these new migrants also experienced effects and consequences, and then promoted effects and consequences onto the communities of migrants themselves. One of the major consequences of the increased migration of the 19th century is an increase in ethnic and racial prejudice against migrants specifically. So, so fear of and discrimination against immigrants into a new place is not something new. Um, but it was definitely heightened with the increase in migration in the 19th century. So we might see informal prejudice and discrimination against um, new migrants to an area, uh, but we also see state-promoted um, regulation or movements against migrants and immigrants into particular areas. A couple of examples of this would be the White Australia Act, which is an interesting and ironic uh, movement in the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, because of course the white Australians were themselves migrants to Australia. They are not the indigenous Aboriginal people of Australia, but as they had come to power in the form of the British Australian government, white Australians began to see themselves as the proper Australians and increasing ethnic and racial prejudice against non-white immigrants into Australia um, created a, a situation where um, people found it very difficult to live and work and operate in Australia if they weren't white. Um, in the United States, this ethnic and racial prejudice, again, took both formal and informal um, manifestations. Um, informally, we saw we see targeting of different migrant populations in different parts of the United States, some of whom today in the 21st century we would consider white. Um, so, for example, Italian and Irish populations, because they were predominantly Catholic instead of Protestant, were often targeted with discrimination and sometimes even violence in different parts of the United States. And uh, the United States government played a role in this as well. The Chinese Exclusion Act was literally a law passed in the United States to limit the number of Chinese who could come into the United States at all because migrants were seen as a threat to the status quo, to the way that the community had been developing in recent memory. And so 
Consequences of migration include demographic shifts as men and women take on different roles in their communities. Um, migrants, as they move into new areas, create ethnic enclaves and transplant their home culture. This increasing diversity was seen as a threat to majority cultures in some areas, which led to informal prejudice as well as state regulation of immigration in these regions. Thank you for watching today's video, for sticking with me in this whole thing. I hope that this was helpful for you and that you were able to find some additional examples as you are reading and learning about this topic. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye.